an opportunity to ask questions answered. My name is Carlos Leva. I'm the CEO of Three Lines Publishing, and I'm also the attorney and managing partner with the Digital Business Law Group. So what are we going to cover today? First of all, an introduction as to what is a comprehensive audit initiative. In other words, how do you prepare? Uh, ten, ten steps to launch an initiative if you if you have not launched as of yet, uh, despite, despite the fact that you're uh, a subscriber or you're just getting started in your launch or you just touched pieces of it, we're going to give you 10 steps to hopefully uh, get, that, um, get that going faster um, and in a more effective way. And then we're going to cover the security rule part one, which is really the entirety of the administrative safeguards and as far as as far as technical material and difficult to understand material it's probably not going to get any more difficult than today because we're going to cover um, risk assessment risk management and all that tough part of the security rule so there's a lot of material to cover if we go over we will pick up in the next uh, segment because um, it would the, the next segments where we cut where we cover the technical safeguards of the security rule where we cover the physical safeguards of the security rule are not nearly as dense as what we're going to cover today so first of all the learning objectives is we want to provide a foundation understanding of the roadmap you must have in order to survive a HIPAA audit what a comprehensive initiative means we're going to define that what's not comprehensive key components of coverage why tracking your progress matters and uh, a little bit of systems thinking how not to chase your hip tail as you're trying to um, track your initiative 10 steps to launch and really the majority of the time is going to be spent on number seven here security rule part one so we want to provide organizational stakeholders with a sense of how your compliance auditing, auditing initiative should be based on full coverage of the HIPAA requirements and, and what that entails from a practical perspective. Now, the Office of Inspector, uh, the OIG, the Office of Inspector General just came out with a um, harsh uh, indictment, if I can call it that, for want of a better word, of uh, Health and Human Services, HHS's audit practices, especially regarding small breaches and some other things that they haven't been doing. So it's not a uh, well-kept secret that HHS, apart from breach notification and apart from large breaches, has not been enforcing high-tech high to the degree that the High Tech Act actually mandated, and is so much so that the Office of Inspector General has now issued this report. And obviously, when the OIG issues a report, then HHS is going to have to respond in some way to try to address that. So you could be looking at a lot more initiatives coming out of HHS that I don't know if I, I would call them uh, aggressive. Uh, in their enforcement for smaller breaches, small organizations, but I think def there's definitely going to be a change from what has uh, been their status quo enforcement uh, mechanisms to date. Uh, and we know that audits are going to get uh, started, but you know, before we talk about audits and that kind of enforcement, you're more at risk to be audited if you have a breach obviously because if you have any kind of significant breach you're going to be audited and now maybe even if you have a minor breach depending on what the definition of minor is you may be audited and if a patient complains about their PHI or your treatment of their PHI um, or lack thereof and on uh, which they're free to do obviously and on uh, the face of the complaint the facts show willful neglect, like for example, uh, neglecting to provide them their PHI, which got Signet a $4.3 million fine about five years ago because they completely refused to provide PHI to 20 patients. If 
HHS gets a complaint where the facts look like there's been willful neglect, then they don't have an option. They've been mandated by the High Tech Act to audit. So those are the those are the mechanisms by which you're more likely to get audited than being randomly selected. So let's define comprehension. First of all, you're going to have to get through the three parts of the protocol or, or, or upon which the protocol is based, which is the HIPAA privacy rule, the HIPAA security rule, and the high-tech breach notification rule. Those are the three major areas that you will get audited on. Now, we like to use this equation, and, and we'll use it more and more, and I'll refer to it, but you need policies, which is essentially your organizational your organization's intentions, what you intend to do. You need underlying processes that underpin the policy, and you need tracking mechanisms that track process results at the granularity level of a requirement. So, for example, you need a training policy. You need processes that underpin the training. Is it going to be classroom training? Is it going to be video training? Is it going to be? Is there going to be a test? What score is passing? And then you need to be able to show who took what course when. Right, so if I'm an auditor and I'm and I'm asking you about training, I'm I'm going to ask you for your policy. I'm going to want to see that. I'm going to review that. I'm going to ask you to tell me about your processes, how you go about doing your training, and I'm going to ask for the database reports or spreadsheet that show me who was trained when. That's VDE. That's visible demonstrable evidence at the granularity of a requirement. And if you can consistently do that across 169 requirements that are in the audit protocol, then you're well on your way to establishing a culture of compliance. So your compliance program must allow you to produce and track VDE for each requirement of the HIPAA rules. So as a practical matter, what does this mean? Well, you don't have to, um, sorry, you don't have to guess as to uh, what the requirements are, they're in the audit protocol, they're in the rules. So you have to have a clear understanding of the requirement. If you don't clearly understand the requirements, obviously, how are you going to be able to comply? Then you must be able to show visible demonstrable evidence for each requirement if you intend to show anywhere near full compliance. If you currently can't show visible demonstrable evidence for each requirement, you must have a plan in place for achieving the same. In other words, you need to be able to show an auditor, okay, yes, We've done this much. We know we're weak in these areas. We're working on that. You got in place. You got a plan in place to get the rest of your initiative done. Okay, that's going to be more, much more satisfying to a auditor uh, or to a court of law than you know what we got five percent of our initiative implemented, and there's no plan in sight to get the rest done. All right. If you have, if you take some sort of approach like that, you're probably going to end up uh, being found in willful neglect, where willful neglect is fifty thousand dollars per violation, up to one point five million for similar violations for violations of the same thing. That's not that one point five million is not a cap. It's one point five million maximum per type of violation. Turns out that a breach of any number of records would be in a, a, you know one record, two records, three records, four records. Those are all identical violations if they're uh, you know, encompassed by the same breach. Clearly, items two and three mandate that you have the ability to track progress at the granularity level of a requirement. That's what our whole philosophy is as far as you being able to prepare for an audit. Prior to the High Tech Act, there were anecdotal, the 42 questions that you may be asked, all that is nonsense. You can only be asked what's in the requirements. Okay? They can't ask you about stuff that's not in the requirements because it's not, that's not the law. Okay? So, Martin, I'm going to pause because this thing won't go to the next slide for some reason right now and ask you if there's anything, any questions at this point. No, there there are no questions, but I wanted to point out in your control panel, there's a handout section that has all the slides from today's session. Great, and I did, uh, Martin and I talked about before the, we launched the webinar, and I forgot to do this housekeeping item. We do have our public webinar that is uh, usually the third Thursday 
of every month. It was the 22nd. We had to move that up to the 15th uh, for scheduling reasons. So you should have gotten an announcement that if you register for the 22nd, you don't need to re-register, but you just need to note on your calendar that that public webinar has been moved forward by a week. Now that doesn't affect um, you know these next four Wednesdays that are all about and for our subscribers. So um, I, I do have a qu question to make sure I understand. The 1.5 million is for the type of violation rather than the number of records breached for a particular type of breach. So my understanding is that that would be it, whether you had 5,000, 50,000, 100,000, or 200,000 records breached, that would be considered one type of violation. And there could be a, a, um, a $1.5 million fine for that violation, max. Okay? But if they come in and they find 20 other violations that you're in willful neglect of, then that 1.5 million you can multiply by 20. Okay, so it's when you see that 1.5 million, it's per identical violation. Does that make sense? Yes. Now that 1.5 million, obviously, when you're looking at breach notification, is that's just a fine, and I don't believe that fine is in, in calculated in the Pontymons. Institute's calculation of what it costs to notify based on a, on a breach, which they calculate for healthcare somewhere around $318. If you take a conservative calculation of $200, multiply times 5,000 records, and you have a cost of notification alone of a million dollars. You have any significant breach of 5, 10, 15, 20,000, that's the significant enough breach that's going to ruin your day and cost you millions of dollars um, and obviously you know we'll get to a part where we talk about encryption as, as the ultimate safe harbor but yes that 1.5 is max per identical violation now HHS has put out an audit protocol you can do a Google of HHS audit protocol you will find this out there they used to have a spreadsheet and I've asked people they used to have a, a, a spreadsheet that you could actually an interactive spreadsheet, you could actually actually say, give me the ones for the privacy rule, give me the ones for the security rule, give me the ones for breach notification, and it would switch back and forth. I can't find that anywhere anymore. They just have this long list of these are the ones for the privacy rule, these are more privacy rule violations, these are still more privacy, not violations, audit protocols. All they've done, uh, if you are familiar with uh, CFR 164, is they've taken the sections and they listed them in here and you know section 502 which is the general rule for the privacy rule that has I'm counting right six different entries 504 has three and so on so they've just taken the requirements broken up the sections and have multiple requirements per section and kind of dumped that and said those are requirements they've been there all along people just had this sort of either you know didn't want to get down to the rigors of actually understanding the regulations but it's not a mystical thing they can only ask you about the requirements that what what the regulations actually say you have to do okay same thing for the security rule now the security rule has a lot more uh, detailed sort of audit protocol requirements because that's sort of the nature of the rule um, and then for breach notification Breach notification is really a course of a different color because the, the audit protocol requirements for breach notification are really driven by uh, readiness, preparedness. You, you, you for example, 164.402, risk assessment of breach. When you go read 402, it doesn't say risk assessment of breach. It, I think it says definition section or something. But it, what, what they're saying here is do you have a uh, this is my interpretation. Do you have a methodology that you walk through to determine whether or not a breach has happened? And if so, and I'm an auditor, show me. Show me what your protocol is. Show me what your analytical framework is for figuring out that you have a breach. Show me that you're prepared to notify individuals. Show me that you understand uh, who you're supposed to notify, depending on the, the amount of individuals uh, impacted. Show me a model letter, etc. Show me some documentation that you understand timeliness and so forth. It's a preparedness sort of um, audit protocol for breach notification. Now, for the privacy rule, 
we map those requirements to our privacy rule checklist. For the security rule, we map it to the security rule checklist. Okay? For the breach notification, they're really mapped to the breach notification framework. So uh, because all of you are subscribers, you have the tools already in hand to deal effectively with these audit requirements. Okay, plus the templates and model documents and everything else that we provided with each one of those products. And we're going to talk more about those tools as we go along here because that's what we're trying to get done here, right? This is for our subscribers only. We want to do a deeper dive into how you go about uh, satisfying these requirements. So here's the total, 81 for the privacy rules, 78 for the security rule. 10 for breach notification, 169. It's not really 169 because they multiply. They, they have multiples per session. And when we map these to our various checklists, we still come up with a pretty significant um, amount. And I don't know what that amount is. I need to go back and count it, but 50, 60, 70, uh, you know, that we condense the requirements down to still more, more manageable, uh, but not trivial. So, One of the things where you can get caught up, especially if you're trying to buy software that will help you comply, first of all, a lot of this, and especially when we talk about the administrative requirements and the security rule, there, there, there is no software that can help you with that. Anybody that says that they're selling you software with that is probably just flat out lying to you. They can help you with the technical safeguards, all right? Uh, pieces of software can help you uh, for example, do a risk assessment if you want to scan your network. But so much of what's in the administrative safeguards is process and organizational issues that there's just no software that's going to solve that for you. You're just going to have to go through the process. And that's what we attempt to, dis to uh, describe in our checklist requirement by requirement. But you can be misled because there are partial solutions everywhere. And if you don't understand what you're buying, you can have a death by a thousand cuts. Okay, and we like to explain that as the difference between wetware and software. So wetware, what we think, what our subscription is, is educational material. Wetware is biological gray matter in a fixed medium suitable for other humans to consume. Essentially, it's education-based. Okay, wetware is in software. Where Wetware is what you need to know in order to comply, right? And, and moreover, how to go about how to go about doing it. The requirements, if you study them, will tell you the what. The audit protocol, those 169 entries tell you the what. We actually tell you the how. How to go about complying with these particular requirements. Okay? So wetware is a knowledge transfer vehicle whose focus is on education. Software often is sold as a place where you store and manage your visible demonstrable evidence. All right, those are two different things. And in fact, we, we're, we're going to have a public webinar here pretty soon where uh, I'll talk about how you can create a repository, a compliance repository without any software at all. You can just do that on the network share if you have the, the right taxonomy defined, or you can create, you can do it using something like Google Apps, or you can do it using something like Microsoft SharePoint, or you know, lots of tools out there that will let you cr create repositories that have uh, version control of documents. I mean, those are those today are now horizontal enabling technologies that you can get almost for next to nothing, literally. So be careful what you're buying when you're buying software. Compliance software should be much more than a file repository. It should help you to effectively manage your initiative. So what we like to say is compliance software without wetware is just an empty container. Wetware is self-contained. Software is going to require wetware, so be careful what you're buying as far as solutions, okay? And there are partial solutions in software to help you do risk assessment and training as well, okay? You can buy, you know, you can buy, you can do a death by a thousand cuts for training, incident management, repositories, um, automated privacy verification, security incident tracking, network monitoring. And, you know, a lot of these things, if you had to and you're a small practice or a county, government, you can implement using spreadsheets, right? And we'll talk about some spreadsheets, some tools that we provide, uh, you know, gap analysis and remediation, on and on. There's a lot of um, stuff out there that can partially address 
the problem, okay? And don't really take a comprehensive view of what do I really need to do? What's what, what, how, how do I how do I eat this uh, elephant one bite at a time? And do I even recognize the elephant? So there's hundreds, if not thousands, of point solutions available. Okay. So we know that there's a bunch of partial solutions. We're now going to talk about comprehensive components. And Martin, are there any questions? Not at this time. They're mesmerized. Well, now we're going to get to the this part where there's going to be a lot of questions when we get into the security rule here pretty quick. But comprehensive components, education. You need to be a lot more literate today after the High Tech Act. So you need High Tech Act training, omnibus rule training, privacy rule training, security rule training, breach notification training, business associate training. That feel good, dumbed down training that everybody used to do before. High Tech Act, that's no longer good enough because it's the world has gotten more complex and you just, after the High Tech Act, you just need to have, a, your entire staff needs to have a higher level of compliance literacy if you're going to be able to transform compliance, HIPAA compliance from this bolt-on necessary evil thing to something that's a part of your organizational DNA. So you need risk assessment training, risk management training, social media, mobile, cloud computing, uh, perhaps some certification. Post high tech, the compliance, more compliance literacy is required. That's that. That's the message here. And I think, I don't know, Martin. I, I ask you this every time. We should go back and count one these days. How many training products do we have now? Like uh, twenty. Uh, less, uh, Sixteen. Sixteen. Okay. So it's all about requirements. Okay. If you're going to have a complete coverage, it's going to be about requirements. Now, you guys. Uh, this shouldn't look foreign to you. This is the, the, uh, an example of part of the checklist for the privacy rule. It's, it's privacy rule, uses in disclosure 001, violation of the rule. There's lots of reasons why you need to have a rigorous methodology to understand whether the rule is violated. First of all, the first component of the analytical framework for breach notification is whether or not there was violation of the privacy rule. Okay. And in order to answer that question, you're going to have to know how to consistently determine and have a methodology in place uh, that allows you to consistently determine when the privacy rule has been violated. If the privacy rule is, hasn't been violated, there can't be a breach by definition. Obviously, you're going to want to know if the privacy rule has been violated when you sanction an employee for violating the rule. Otherwise, how are you going to justify the sanction? And if you don't have a rigorous methodology for figuring out when the privacy rule has been violated, then how are you going to apply it consistently across breaches, across employees, etc. So we are going to come out with a map from those 169 requirements to what we have in our checklist and what we have in our breach notification rule to make it a lot easier for you to comprehend that, in fact, when you bought the subscription plan, you got coverage. Okay, And that analytical framework for determining whether the uh, privacy rule has been violated is actually part of the breach notification framework where that, that's included. But here we give you in, in this checklist item, and we'll get to what a checklist item is. Obviously, this really should be old hat for you guys because you should be using these tools already. Uh, but a checklist item actually gives you the, thing, the, the, the three things that, well, three, three plus one, I would say, or, or four. It gives you the policy, the process, and the tracking mechanisms at the granularity level of requirement, plus a description of what this thing, this checklist item is, plus a reference to the sections of the regulations that we are dealing with. So here's just a continuation of the privacy rule. PBR stands for Patient's Bill of Rights, and that, that is section 164.520 through 528. Now, this Patient's Bill of Rights, um, that's what we call it. You'll never, you're never going to hear HHS call this these sections the patient's bill of rights. All right, that's that's a term uh, that we've introduced because it, it contains 164.520 notice of privacy practices to individuals, you know, and then going on to how do you handle restriction requests? Uh, what do you do with confidentiality requests? If somebody says, hey, can you instead of notifying me this way, can you notify me that way? What do you do? What kind of process? Uh, and tracking mechanism and logging do you have in place when somebody says 
can you give me access to my PHI? You know, that that request is like, yeah, we'll give you access. It's not, it, it can't be fulfilled. Like, yeah, we'll give you access to it when we kind of get around to it. And that's not the way it works. That section of the patient's bill of rights says you got to do it within 30 days. And if you don't do it within 30 days, you got to notify the patient in writing why you can't meet the 30-day deadline. And if, and because you can't meet the 30-day 30 30 day deadline, what deadline will you meet? And somebody's got to sign it and be responsible for it. Somebody's got to have in their job title that they are the ones responsible for processing and access requests. Now, since the High Tech Act and since the you know the, the mass movement to electronic health records, m almost all the focus has been on the security rule. And I guarantee you that if you haven't done much to update your privacy rule since the High Tech Act, you're going to be in willful neglect because. In the past, there just weren't that many people asking for their PHI. But Signet will tell you that at least five years ago, 20 people asked, and they got fined 4.3 million because they were stupid and just refused to give people their PHI. You can't refuse. This is why we call it the patient's bill of right. You can't refuse to give them their PHI. If they ask for it, they got to get it, and you got to give it to them in some reasonable format. You know, and I mean, yeah, you can push back a little bit on, on the format, but, you know, most of the time, PDF will probably work. And then you have some requirements that we call privacy rule administrative rights, okay? And training, sanctions, documentation policy, how you manage complaints and all that. These privacy rule checklist items map to the 81 requirements. And we're going to draw a map so you can see that visually. Uh, here in the not too distant future and provide it to you guys uh, as part of your subscription plan. Okay, any questions on that? Yes. Can providers change the patient for their charge the patient for their PHI? Yeah, but it's a really, really minimal charge. It's like the cost of producing it. And I, I think when it's EPHI, it's even less. It's I you know, I think it's a matter of policy. I, you know, if I were a head of a practice, I wouldn't. I wouldn't charge at all. It, it's. I don't think you can even charge the cost of labor anymore for free EPHI. So you're only kind of opening yourself up for, you know, you overcharged. Um, so you got to be really careful with that. You know what I mean? I, I don't. I don't think um, if you overcharge, you're definitely going to be uh, called on the carpet for it because the, the, the charges are supposed to be reasonable. And if it's EPHI minimal, and you can read what what it says in the rule, right? Uh, but uh, you know what? If it's electronic, my policy would be just give it to them. That's the cost of doing business. We recapture that somewhere else. That's that's the only one we have at this time. Okay. I'm not going to belabor this. This is a security rule checklist for, I mean, this is a checklist, examples of checklist items for the security rule. You can see that for something like the risk assessment, which is part of the administrative, so this is security rule, administrative safeguards, standard one, this is the first implementation specification, which is risk assessment, and it has nine steps, A, B, C, D, and that's how we break it out. And we're following the NIST protocol to do that, right? So we were getting a lot more granular in our security rule checklist items because we're not providing you the what, but we're not providing you the NIST 20 questions per requirement that make you want to pull your hair out because, you know, what, what the, the NIST documents are good as reference documents, but when they get to specifying, they never tell you how to comply. And I'll let you in on a little secret, and you probably know this if you've heard me before, they're never going to tell you how to comply because if they told you how, then they would open themselves up for the argument that goes like this. Well, you told me to do it this way, and now you're saying I'm not in compliance. Right? So what this does is, for every requirement, what they do is they play the 20 questions game. Well, for this requirement, you should be thinking about this, and you should be thinking about that, and you should consider the other. And, you, you know, and by the time you get through the first 20 questions, you want to pull your hair out because you're looking for some guidance as to how to go about complying with this requirement. This is what we do in our checklist. Okay? Obviously, this is just the summary of a checklist that we're looking at here. We'll look at a checklist item. Uh, in, a, in, in a little bit that shows you that we are actually specifying how you go about complying with this particular requirement. 
So we don't need to, you know, uh, dwell too much here. Breach notification, we told you that's covered. Those requirements are covered in our breach notification framework because that's really a preparedness framework, but we have a methodology for determining when a breach should be triggered. Part of that methodology is a methodology for uh, determining when the privacy rule has been violated, and we have model uh, letters to the media, model letters to HHS, and so forth. A security incident document, a security tracking um, spreadsheet, etc. Lots of tools there to be able to show that you are prepared for a breach, uh, not if it happens, but when it happens. So one of the questions would be, and, and, and if you don't have a, a rigorous analytical framework that you go through and you're not tracking every incident that comes in, and remember, an, an unsuccessful incident, an attempt at a breach is a security incident. It's not a breach, but it's an incident. You need to be able to track all incidents, okay? Right? Breaches are going to be a subset, hopefully a very small subset, of the security incidents that come your way. But that's one of the first questions I would ask if I were an auditor. Talk to me about how you're tracking security incidents right? as part of the security rule. If you give me that deer in the headlights look right away, then I know that you guys are probably in willful neglect because how can you possibly report on incidents, know if there's a breach, if you're not tracking it? And I'm going to ask you some follow-up questions, okay? Well, show me your incident tracking database or show me your incident tracking spreadsheet. And do your employees know who to call? Who's the point of contact if somebody thinks that an incident has happened and so forth, okay? So what you need and what we provide is step-by-step -step guidance. Now, this is, this is an example of one checklist item Privacy rule uses and disclosures, UD001, violation of the rule. This is what we talked about earlier. Here's a description of it. Here's what statutory section from the auto protocol it references. We also, in this one, make a reference to our breach notification framework. Here's the policy statement, and all these policy statements are extracted to become your policy statement for the privacy rule. That's where the model, the model privacy statement comes from the checklist items. You didn't know that. We just pulled it directly out of the checklist items, okay? What processes you should implement to satisfy this, these requirements and what suggested tracking mechanisms you should put in place so that you can capture visible demonstrable evidence for, in this case, a violation of the privacy rule, okay? And then we have a way in scorecards where you can grade yourself as to where you're at with this requirement. Is it missing? Is it planned? Is it implemented but basic? Is it implemented but functional? Is it implemented but excellent? Okay, and depending on how it's implemented, right? You, you assign a certain score into our scorecard, and you and you can give yourself a, not only a, um, a a score which allows you to communicate where you are in your initiative to your own management team and staff, also allows you to communicate where you are uh, in your initiative to an auditor. And just having a methodology in place where you can show an auditor that you're tracking what's going on is probably going to put you 99% uh, ahead of your peers. Here's, here's a checklist item from the security rule. This is security rule, administrative safeguard 001A, risk assessment, gather data. That's the first step in the risk assessment. We're going to talk a lot more about risk assessments in a little while, but here it is. Right? For this granular level of a requirement, this is what you need to do. Right? And the policy statement says is it our policy, it is our policy to maintain the data gathered for risk assessments evergreen by updating our as is documents whenever significant changes occur, etc. Right? And then the process you should implement for gathering the data and how you should track it, etc. Okay. Now in the breach notification framework, we said breach notification was um, a horse of a different color, but you know, if you have on, if you have um, a, an incident, one 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 of the first kinds of questions you need to ask is, well, you know, was it was it uh, was the PHI paper? And then you just go to the notification analysis because the security rule doesn't deal with paper. Right? I mean, you can have a breach of paper, but the security rule doesn't deal with that because the security rule deals with EPHI, electric PPHI. If, if it wasn't paper, 
You know, then you go and you say, well, if you're going to determine whether there's a breach and you're trying to determine whether or not you encrypted correctly, it's not just a matter of saying, well, are we encrypted? It's, well, was the PHI that was compromised at rest? Was it being transferred over the Internet, transferred over the wire, PHI in motion? Was it being disposed of? You need to know the state of the PHI before you can answer the question whether or not you encrypted it correctly. Right? It's going to matter. PHI at rest is PHI that you have on your servers and your database, etc. That's going to comprise the lion's share of PHI. But it may have been PHI in motion, in which case you you have other NIST protocol requirements that you got to meet, or it, it's PHI that you were disposing, and then there's protocols for disposing it correctly. Okay, if you encrypt it greater than or equal to uh, the NIST protocols. Uh, recommendations by the secretary who relied on this protocol, then you just complete the incident document. This incident document is something that we provide for you in our security rule checklist, and you stop. Otherwise, you go do the notification analysis. You go figure out whether or not there really was a breach, what was the privacy rule violated, and answer all those questions. So tracking, these are our scorecards. These line up to, so here we have 30. Here's the count. We reduced the 81 requirements, and again, we're going to draw you a map from the privacy rule to 30. And the reason we were able to reduce them is because HHS had those multiple entries per section. Okay, and here's where you give yourself a grade, and you should be using this, if not something more sophisticated, but at a minimum, fill out the spreadsheet, give yourself a grade, and you can communicate with your management team. You can show them where we are in our implementation of the initiative, okay? Same thing for the security rule. Here we reduced 78 requirements in the audit protocol to 58, okay? Breach notification, I believe we now have um, a scorecard for that, Martin, and um, I believe we have a scorecard, you know, that we've we've uh, made available, actually publicly made available, the scorecards, um, not the tools and templates that the subscribers have, but I think we have a breach notification. Just take that as an action item. Because I, I believe I, I created one recently. So, God. You, you have some questions at this point, Martin. Uh, what's the difference between the various grades we give ourselves, such as the difference between basic and functional? Okay, that's a great question. So basic means you got some sort of um, you implemented something, but you know it, it it may not be the greatest, and it may be a band aid, it may be a workaround, but it's something, okay? Um, as opposed to planned or missing, right? Functional means that it's more than basic. It's been working for a while, you know. And, and the guidelines that we give is, you know, what well, it's 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 been working for. Um, for six months or so, right? Something's been working for you for six months. We say, well, that's functional. You know what I mean? You, you, um, you know, it's working, right? It, if you've been working for six months or longer, and you've had time to improve, you know, the functional aspects of it and to tweak it, then that would be excellent. And these are just obviously um, arbitrary, but. If it's completely missing, you know it's missing, and so you know at a minimum you should have no, you should have every you shouldn't have any zeros, right? Because if it's a zero, you should really say, yeah, we know it's a zero, but we got a plan. We got a plan in place. Now you better have a plan in place. You better actually be able to show a timeline on where you're working on this stuff, right? So you can just say, here's our plan for getting the the items that we have marked as one done, right? If if you've addressed it and you got something working, it may not be perfect. I would say it's two. It's kind of like a minimal uh, fulfillment of the requirement, but it's it's not nothing. Okay, does that make sense? Yes. Okay, quickly, just a little bit about agile versus heavyweight, and I'm going to go through this pr pretty quick because we want to get to the meat of this thing, which is really the security rule risk assessments and things like that, but most projects fail because of people and process challenges that have very little to do with the underlying technologies, and the security rule B 
beast and monster, which it really is, the 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 the, the most uh, insidious part of it is the administrative safeguards, which have nothing very little to do with technology at all. Okay, they're the process parts of the administrative safeguards. You don't need a bunch of consultants to help you with those. They're not going to be of all that much help unless you're going to pay somebody by the hour to develop your policies. And obviously, if you got our subscription plan, you don't need to pay them by the hour because you have your policies, right? And, and you have the how-to. You just got to go through it. You got to do the work. The security rule implementation is really more aptly described as a change process. You're trying to change the culture within your organization, and you're trying to manage risk in this 24-7, 365, always on, always half hackable environment that we now live in, and nobody envisions us going back, right? So this problem is, going to only, is only going to get more complex, not less. And sooner or later, and if the OIG has its way, it's going to be sooner, they're going to push for medium size and smaller practices to get on with the program because our security is only as good as the weakest link. So uh, I would not take the fact that uh, HHS has kind of slow walked the, the high tech implementation as a sign that things are going to stay that way forever. An iterative agile methodology is required, but what exactly is that? Right? Really, agile historically has been um, associated with software. It actually, uh, unless you're in a, 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 a kind of a geek of agile, you wouldn't know. Agile is really based on this. Uh, sort of methodology of dealing with wicked problems. We'll get to that, what a wicked problem is in a second here, but it, it, it actually started with urban planning, um, and, and then it, the, the software industry said, oh, yeah, that's exactly how we need to approach software development, and now we've borrowed it for compliance. But agile compliance is a group of methods based on an iterative, that's the key, an incremental approach. That means get started. Everything about our tools, everything about our education, everything about what we provide is get started on this. Don't form a committee to name a committee to study the problem because you're not going to understand it until you really get started. So get started. Most important thing you can do. Agile promotes adaptive planning, evolutionary development and implementation, rapid and flexible response. And given all the change that's going on in the healthcare industry, you're going to need a rapid and flexible response. The conceptual framework. The implementation cycle never ends. This is another thing that you need to understand on your way to developing a culture of compliance. This is not a set and forget one time Big Bang project. This is an evergreen something that you're going to have to build into the organizational DNA. Okay, so this concept of agile was captured by Tom Peters probably over 30 years ago, famous management consultant, by fail forward fast. Okay, go ahead and get started, make some mistakes, learn from your mistakes, and then get on with the next aspect of it. Fail forward fast. Why? Because it's the only way, failing forward fast, the only way to affect the only effective way of dealing with a wicked problem. And a wicked problem is one that has the following characteristics. You don't understand the problem until you've started developing a solution. I guarantee you, if you haven't ever done a risk assessment, you don't understand the slightest bit about what a risk assessment is. I don't care how many books you've read. I don't care how many certifications you've gotten. Until you do the first one, you're not in the game. You don't understand the problem. You actually got to do one before you start understanding the problem. The second characteristic of a wicked problem is there's no stopping rule. Since there's no definitive problem, there can't be any definitive solution. Solutions are not right or wrong. They're just better than others or worse or good enough. Okay, every wicked problem is unique and novel. Every solution is a one-shot operation. And here, with respect to compliance, if you pick the wrong methodology getting started, you may you may be stuck living with that for the next 20 years and probably through your first major breach before the organization wakes up and says, oh, well, maybe we had the wrong approach here. So it turns out that big, really complex problems require many, many, many small solutions. Right? Not one big bang solution, lots and lots and lots of smaller solutions. So again, don't form a committee, name a committee to study the problem, just get started. Heavyweight compliance, on the other hand, is focused on well-defined, aka tame problems. You know, governance, risk management, compliance. This is the, the, the language of heavyweight compliance, how compliance used to be thought of. It's a formal academic model, it's a static model, it's a linear model. And the comparison here is we, humankind, we know how to build bridges. 
We build hundreds of thousands of bridges. We understand the physics, the calculus, all the mathematics. Every once in a while we get it wrong, you know, but we under, that's a tank problem. We understand how to do that. On the other hand, something like standing up a HIPAA compliance program is completely wicked. Wicked not in the sense that it's evil, wicked in the sense that it's hard because it's mostly an organizational problem. For example, how you get those grumpy old docs that hate HIPAA, not that anybody really loves HIPAA, but those guys really hate HIPAA, and in the past, it was HIPAA schmipa. We don't have to comply because the government uh, is not going to enforce it. The game has changed, but those guys don't want to change, right? So resisting, uh, resisting the law, right, it, 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 it is, is something that is done all the time. And the majority, probably, of the organizations out there are resisting implementing some portion of the High Tech Act or HIPAA in some way, shape, or form. So how, how are you going to break those barriers? Well, that's an organizational problem. It's not a physics problem. It's not a mathematical problem. I don't care how well you understand calculus. It ain't going to help you with that particular problem. But so what? Well, the pace of innovation is accelerating. Okay? There's a lot of other things competing for the mind share in healthcare right now. And, and, and the healthcare is being turned upside down, as, as uh, all of you well know. Right? And you know, there's a lot of risk. There's going to be this huge movement to electronic health records, which is uh, maybe mostly done, but not all the way done. Okay, that was no small feat. That that brought the healthcare industry kicking and screaming into the 21st century. Patient portals, and by the way, patient portals. If you're doing any kind of uh, patient portal and you, and you're delivering healthcare services using the internet or telemedicine and the first patient encounter is on the portal, then that's when you have to provide the notice of privacy practices, just like when that patient first walks into your room. And I can almost I can almost guarantee you that nobody's doing that in their patient. Everybody's got patient portals, and I bet people that get some kind of care electronically before they ever visit the doctor don't have the notice of privacy practices presented to them. And, and that's been in the privacy rule long before the High Tech Act. Okay, pay for performance, right? ICD-10, we just recently got implemented, the Affordable Care Act, uh, having to track quality measures, price and transparency, mobile health, and bring your own device. I mean, all these things are happening at the same time, right? So healthcare is experiencing 150 years of change in five, right? And it's an incredible amount of change. I've never seen so much change in a particular industry all happening at the same time. And although it makes it harder for a compliance officer to get mind share when all this all this change is going on on the other hand you can say you know what because we're changing all these things we actually need to change the way we think about compliance and bring that into our DNA as well okay and since we got we got all this change going on we might as well include this because it's only incremental but we can't leave this thing as this bolt on because now there's real risk. Breach notification is the 800-pound gorilla that's going to come crashing down on the organization's head one day and cost it between 50, 30, and 50 million, 50, 30, maybe 50 million dollars, plus class action lawsuits, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? It was going to happen. It's going to happen. So you might as well deal with this change now uh, instead of later. So you know, heavyweight compliance was. This idea that you could define all the requirements up front, that you could test all the requirements for coverage, and that you could int integrate the requirements in, into your workflows. It was like big bang compliance. And the problem with big bang compliance, it, was, it took so long to do, and there was a slow feedback loop. So with agile compliance, it's define, test, integrate, verify. Define, test, integrate, verify. Define, test, integrate, verify. That's solving the problem incrementally. It's a faster feedback loop. Why do you need a fast feedback loop? Because you don't understand what the hell you're doing until you get started. And so the fast feedback loop helps you better understand the problem as you go. You're going to wind up with a better solution down the road. And a solution that's more agile, which means more flexible, easier to modify, etc. So I'm going to let you read this comparison table right here. Our Agile methodology is based on something that we borrowed from NIST, which is Assess, Simplify, Protect, Monitor, Report. This applies to your entire compliance initiative, not just the security rule. Assess, Simplify, Protect, Monitor, Report. And we're going to walk through here in, 
in a few minutes just how it applies directly to the security rule and specifically to performing a risk assessment. Martin, any questions at this point? No, we don't have any questions at this time. Okay. Ten steps to, to launch. We're going to go through these pretty quick. You guys have project plans. These come right out of the project plans or the chunks that we have available. If you haven't logged in and you haven't seen these, they're out there. Um, this is a plan that was uh, designate a HIPAA privacy officer and security officer. Right. This is the first step, and you have to have both a named HIPAA privacy officer and a named HIPAA security officer. They can be one of the same person, but they have to be named. People in the organization need to know who your HIPAA privacy officer is. You know, uh, nine times out of ten, you go to uh, your doctor's office and you ask them if they know who their HIPAA privacy officer is. Most don't. HIPAA security officer, the doctors, the nurses, no one knows, right? You need to communicate that. They need to be named individuals. That needs to be part of their title, etc. Right? So that's a no-brainer. You should just do that. Disseminate the model pro policies. We provided model policies for the security rule, for the privacy rule, for breach notifications. Get with the get with the uh, executive team. Make whatever modifications you need to make, as we provide them in PDF and Word um, formats. Distribute them to the organization. Have each member of the organization sign that they read it, and you can check that off your list. Auditor says, "Are your are your uh, are your staff is your staff you know are they are they aware of what the policies are?" And obviously, you should if you have an internet, you should post them uh, on the internet so uh, new new employees uh, can get to it, or people that haven't read it in a while can go back and read it if they have some questions. But that's a no-brainer. Just do that. Got the policies in hand. Just distribute them. Which policies? Well, these are the policies that we give you, and uh, frankly, you can't think of any other policies you would need. One privacy rule policy. We know that some of our competitors have templates, and for the privacy rule, 80% of them is the same redundant stuff, and they have 50 or 60 policies for the privacy rule. I mean, templates. That's ridiculous. It's just for the, re you know, we take our policy right out of our checklist items. One policy for the privacy rule. One for the security rule, one for breach notification, social media, etc. Get these read, distributed, signed, and you can tick that off. Training and awareness. Martin, we got 16 training modules. You decide which ones should apply to the compliance staff, the executive team, the clinical staff. But I can tell you, you, you need a lot more literacy than you used to. So I, I would be careful. If you're still using that dumbed down, feel good, if you wouldn't say it in an elevator type training, you know, that, that ain't going to get, that's not going to be able to build it in, build compliance into the organizational DNA. You're going to have to have people more exposed into what should be happening, when it should be happening, how does it fit into the workflow so that they can understand the importance of what may happen if the right steps aren't taken. Build yourself a compliance repository. I think one of our project plans show you how to do that. Really easy thing to do if you have a wiki, an intranet, uh, Google Apps. It's really just coming up with a taxonomy of where you're going to store stuff. Okay, and here's an example of how you do it. In the root folder, you know, create these folders, or you know, if you're using Google Apps, create these pages under your repository. And or SharePoint, the same thing. You just need a place to store a single version of the truth, right? You got a lot of these documents already. You just need to know where to, so that when you get audited, you're not running around with, like a chicken with its head cut off trying to figure out where my stuff is. I mean, if you can't produce the documents, you're definitely going to be in willful neglect land. Have a repository where you keep one version of the truth. And yes, a lot of vendors will sell you software. But really, with the, the, the high-quality horizontal enabling technologies that are available today, if you're buying software just for a repository of HIPAA, you're probably badly spending your money because you can do it in, in a lot less expensive way. Okay, so this is more of what you should do to create your compliance repository. Step five, if you haven't done a risk assessment, these are the 10, ten steps to launch. Uh, and I, we mean launch, not complete your initiative. Just get it going. So if you haven't 
you're listening and you haven't done one of these steps, then do it, right? Just just do it. Risk assessment. If you haven't done your first risk assessment, <laughs> you're you're long past due. We're going to talk a lot more about risk assessments today, but you got you got to get that done. I mean, that's the, that's the first thing somebody's going to ask you. Well, I'm going to ask you about security incidents and some other stuff, but I'm definitely going to get around to, well, show me your last risk assessment. I'm going to go into a deep level dive into how you did it. And we're going to cover that today. But if you haven't done one, you need to do one. And at a minimum, you should probably be doing a risk assessment once a year. This is not a set and forget thing. Once a year and if your operational environment changes then you need to do a risk assessment every time your operational environment changes what's an example of an operational environment changing a merger and acquisition where you have to move your server room that's clearly that people I mean you know organizations have already been fined for losing tapes and stuff during a move anytime your operational environment changes you got to do another risk assessment I would say a minimum once a year, and I'm telling you that that's like the, the 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 minimum, minimum, minimum. You probably should be doing one once a quarter, okay? And there's actually an argument to be made with the threat landscape databases that are out there that you're kind of doing risk assessments real time because the bad guys keep getting smarter every day. But you know they're not going to wait around to do a risk assessment and plug the holes before they come break into your network. If you haven't gotten your business associate agreements updated, you need to do that, right? If you had one before the omnibus was grandfathered in for a year, that's gone. All right, so we provide you up-to-date business associate agreement, not only between a covered entity and a business associate, but between business associates and business associates. They're getting a lot more complex now. Covered entities uh, are asking for identification if you're a VA, uh, but you better make sure that you have those in place. It's foundational to your initiative. Again, incident tracking and reporting. If you tell me you're not tracking incidents, then uh, that's one ticking mark right away for willful neglect because you can't possibly be have a breach notification program in place if you're not tracking incidents. Patient's Bill of Rights, again, right? You got to show me what, okay, so if I make a request for my records, my PHI, tell me the process that the organization goes through. Who's in charge? And how, how am I, as the patient, going to be guaranteed that I get my PHI within 30 days? How does that work? Okay. Now, this is a privacy rule. This has got nothing to do with the security rule, okay? But it's got, and this, is in, this has been in the privacy rule since the get-go, prior to the High Tech Act. You should have had this in place a long time ago. But why wasn't it in place? Well, first of all, there wasn't electronic health records, so you just go get the paper charts make copies of the paper charts. Second of all, the number of patients that were actually asking for their PHI was small, really, really, really small. It's not huge today, but it's getting bigger all the time, right? It's getting bigger all the time, so you're going to have to have a process in place to handle it. So this is access to PHI, right? You've got to be able to do that. And if a patient wants to amend their PHI, you got to be able to do that. So this is obviously not exhaustive. We're going to go through on the, the next, this Wednesday, for the one more hour, because I think we've eaten up the first hour, and um, six more hours, two more hours every Wednesday for the next three, going through the requirements, requirement by requirement, essentially. But this is a way to get it launched. If you haven't done one of these 10 steps, you need to um, you need to get on that. Okay, now we're going to get to the fun part. HIPAA Security Rule Audit Preparation Part 1. Any questions, Martin? Uh, not at this time, but I just wanted to uh, make a comment about the NOPS and requests for EPHI. I think those are going to grow exponentially, and it'll be like a slip and fall in a supermarket that people do all the time and collect ten thousand dollars. It's just an opinion. Right, you're going to get hit by savvy patients that are definitely going to be testing whether or not covered entities are are prepared uh, to give them their PHI in a timely way. And by the way. Many of you probably don't know this, and HHS has done nothing uh, about this. 
uh, but they were required to, and it's they're long overdue, and they keep saying that it's on their list of things to do. But they were supposed to, as part of the High Tech Act, they were mandated to, not that like this was optional. They were mandated to come up with a methodology for allowing patients to share in the fines that were generated due to patient complaints. So if a patient, 20 patients complained to Cignet, right, and that resulted in a $4.3 million fine, then those 20 patients were supposed to get a cut of that $4.3 million. Now, sooner or later, you know, it's been six years since the High Tech Act has been uh, promulgated. Sooner or later, HHS is going to have to address how they're going to give the patients their cut. And, and that's going to drive some of what Martin uh, is talking about. It's going to drive a lot more requests. You know, we're litigious society. Uh, yes, you know, I believe the majority of people are going to be asking for their PHI because they want to monitor their wellness or their illness. And they want to be more engaged, etc. But, you know, Americans being Americans, there's going to be a percentage that are just going to be testing and trying to get a free ride and collect part of that fine money if you're found to be in willful neglect. So, there's uh, one, one question. Uh, patients can't bring suit on their own, correct? Does the Attorney General have the right to sue on their behalf? I guess that's the Attorney General of their state. HHS can bring a lawsuit, yes. So, so, so the High Tech Act didn't change the fact that, that there's no private cause of action for an individual. Okay, so under pure HIP, under HIPAA. So under pure HIPAA, um, it's either going to be HHS or the State Attorney General. Here's the thing, though, uh, if you haven't been tracking this, is that individuals, nothing prevents individuals from bringing a state law action of negligence, okay, and using HIPAA as a standard of care. In fact, many have done so, and the courts support that. Okay, so if you see some of these class action lawsuits and you say, well, how on earth does that happen? How are they suing on, under HIPAA? They, they can't sue only HHS or state attorney generals. Well, the reason they're suing is because they're suing under a state law theory of negligence, and it doesn't, it doesn't have to be class action. One person could sue a covenant entity or business associate under a state law theory of negligence like you were negligent in providing me my PHI and therefore I had some complications and you know I had diabetes really bad and my foot got amputated. You were negligent because had you provided me my records I might may have better understood. Blah 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 blah. Okay? They're gonna bring it under a state law theory of negligence and they're gonna use HIPAA as the standard of care. And the courts have already approved that. So Yes, that's the, it, it, as a matter of fact, they can't bring something under HIPAA, but as a matter of law, there's ways around it, and the way, the principal way around it is negligence law. So what, what do we want to do here, just philosophically? We want to move you from no compliance story at all to a good story, and by a good story, we mean a good story, a story that just gets incrementally better over time. So that scorecard should just continue to improve, right? That's how you measure it. And, and, and the fact that you have a scorecard in measuring, I guarantee you, is going to distinguish you from 99.9% .9 of your colleagues. And although you may not avoid a, a some slap on the wrist fine, uh, if you can show a rigorous methodology based on requirements and that you're tracking it, you should be able to avoid a store a, a fine of willful neglect, which is where the biggest fines lie. Okay? With full compliance being this aspirational goal that you may never get to. Uh, and that's okay because it's a changing environment. You just want your story to continue to get better and better. And the way you do that is you gotta have a methodology for doing that. And the methodology that we suggest is this one that we talked about, assess, simplify, protect, monitor, report. Okay. Now, here are the four objectives of the security rule. Ensure the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of all EPHI. Now, that's a broad statement. Right? It's like, well, how do you do that? Well, the security rule gives you standards and implementation specifications for how, how, well, the what and the how is what we provide is, is guidance. Protect, protect against any reasonably anticipated threats or hazards of your EPHI. Remember, your security rule is all about EPHI, not about paper. Protect against any reasonably anticipated users or disclosures. 
what this really means is any reasonably anticipated violations of the privacy rule. Okay? And ensure workforce your workforce complies with the security rule, training, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> this is in 164.306A, all right, part of the general principles. And when you see a URL like this, you can click on it and go out to the Hidden Survival Guide and get the full source code for that section. <laughs> Excuse me. There's a concept in the security rule called the flexibility concept or flexibility principle. And in part, it says that you, that you can use any security measures that allow the organization to reasonably and appropriately, these are Weezer words, by the way, did you, because later on a court of law may be trying to determine in the jury, did you do what was reasonable and appropriate for an organization of your size, complexity, capabilities, technical infrastructure, cost of security, et cetera? Did you do what was reasonable and appropriate? That's a standard, and that's like the reasonable person standard negligence, okay? That's a complete weasel, legal weasel word that you can either use uh, as an argument in your favor or it's going to be used to crucify you, that you were actually negligent. You didn't do what was reasonable and appropriate, and therefore X, Y, and Z happened. Okay? Now, there, under the security rule, there are two types of implementation specifications. You have standards, and then you have implementation specifications that implement the standard. That's how the security rule is organized. And under implementation specifications, you have specifications that are labeled required or addressable. Okay? And anytime you see a required specification for any of these sections, it just means you have to implement it. End of statement. You just have to implement it, right? There's no wiggle room. You just got to do it. Where you see something that's labeled an addressable specification, then you must see if you can uh, work with me here and understand this um, legal ease okay? because most lawyers can't let alone layperson but I'll translate it for you uh, shortly assess whether each specification is a reasonable and appropriate safeguard there's those weasel words again in its environment when analyzed with reference to the likely contribution to protecting EPHI and as applicable as applicable implement the specification if it's reasonable and appropriate. Even though it says it's addressable, you got to implement it. If it's reasonable and appropriate, implement it, okay? If implementing the specification is not reasonable and appropriate, then you can't ignore it. No, that would be too easy. You can't ignore it just because it says it's addressable. You have to document why it would not be reasonable and appropriate to implement the specification. So you have to deal with it. You have to document, we decided not to do this because it's not reasonable appropriate for X, Y, Z, and then you're required to implement an equivalent alternative measure. So if you can't implement this, implement something else, but only if it's reasonable and appropriate. It's recursive, right? Bottom line is, we're going to get to this in plain English. A specification required must be implemented. That's it. you got to do it. A specification marked addressable must be reviewed at a minimum by all organizations, regardless of the size. And it, it, it's either got to be implemented as written or implemented via an alternative, if the latter is reasonable and appropriate. Yeah, if there is no implementation that's reasonable and appropriate, well, first of all, let me say this. A standard, and there are a few, lacking a specification must be complied with. That's our take. There are some standards that don't have any implementation specifications. You just essentially invent one, but you got to implement it. you got to comply with the standard. Right? Here's the takeaway. The flexibility principle only goes so far. At a minimum, a compelling rationale and documentation must be provided if addressable specifications are ignored. Okay? If you're going to ignore a specification entirely that's marked addressable, the bottom line is you better have a damn good reason for ignoring it. Okay? And you better have documented that damn good reason for ignoring it. So essentially, because it's addressable, it just doesn't mean that you get to skip it. You still got to deal with it. The SR in general, and why people find it to be such a monster and confusing, represents convergence between policy, law, and technology. So you got to attack it holistically. If you just focus on the IT aspects, you're going to be, you're going to miss most of what we're going to talk about today, which is the administrative safeguards have very little to do with IT. Okay, and it requires a multiple, 
multidisciplinary approach because sooner or later you are going to have to use IT. So it's not going to be like process only is going to get you all the way home. But what you shouldn't do is throw your security rule initiative, throw it over the wall to IT. That's that's asking to be found in willful neglect because because 95 percent of the security rule implementation and complexity is in the administrative safeguards that have nothing to do with technology. So by definition, if you just if you just threw it over and say, oh, you IT guys deal with that, or you IT gals deal with that, then you're going to be in, in willful neglect because you ignored 95% of the requirements. Okay, so you, you have no alternative other than to hug this monster and start dealing with it. And we're going to talk about the first implementation standard, which is the monster standard that complete that contains the a risk assessment. So we're now going to start talking about the administrative safeguards. Any questions here? There's no questions here, but I, I wondered why this wasn't asked. Who decides what's reasonable and appropriate? Well, you do. You're the compliance officer. You're the executive team. I mean, the people oh, that are going to be on the people as, that are going to be on the hook. As the I mean, auditor, do I get to survive, to provide that information or? Come to that conclusion well, the, the, myself. The, 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 well, when you say who defines it, yeah, you know the auditor is going to have an opinion based on organizations of your size, complexity, resources, etc., as to what's reasonable and appropriate. Court of law is going to have an opinion, right, uh, as to what is reasonable and appropriate. So ultimately, yes, there will be third-party verification as to whether or not you, what you thought was reasonable and appropriate was in fact reasonable and appropriate. There are no other questions. Okay, so the administrative safeguards, the A or AAS for short, they're administrative actions, policies, procedures to manage the selection, development, implementation, and maintenance of security measures to protect EPHI and to manage the conduct of the workforce in relation to protection of that information. Okay, there are eight what we call technical standards and one business standard. This is um, um, these are terms that we've created here, okay? And we'll tell you why there there are eight technical standards and one business set standards. But the administrative safeguards contain 18 implementation specifications and comprise over 50% of the security rule as far as implementation specifications. So roughly, there are about 36, uh, 37, 38 implementation specifications. 18 of them are in the administrative safeguards, okay? It, it's 50% of of the implementation specifications, but uh, in my humble opinion, 95% of the complexity. This is where the monster really lives. Okay, the AS defines your EPHI protection program. Essentially, that's what the administrative safeguards, administrative safeguards do. They define your program, and failure to implement an effective risk management strategy could and likely will result in the finding of willful neglect. Now. Technical standards. These are the these are the technical uh, standards. So remember, the security rule is broken up into standards and implementation specifications. You have a standard, and then you have implementation specifications associated with this standard. So you have standard number one, which is by far uh, the most difficult standard, and it's called the security management pro process. Implement policy and procedure, prevent, detect, contain, and correct. Security violations, All right? Standard two: assign security responsibility. Well, that's not quite as complex. You just need to identify a security official, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Workforce security: implement policies and procedures to ensure that only appropriate members have access to PHI. This is a need-to-know requirement. Okay? Information access and management: authorize access to EPHI. Some of these administrative safeguards are really just, uh, from a process perspective, just IT 101. Okay. Now remember, even though these may sound like they have technical words, what an auditor is going to want to know is what are your policies and processes here, not what technology you've implemented to address these standards. Okay, security awareness and training, security incident procedures, contingency plan, emergency uh, and other occurrences, right? Backup, uh, disaster recovery, etc., and evaluation. This eight. Technical standard means 
periodic technical and, and non-technical evaluations, that means that your security rule implementation needs to be kept evergreen, okay? And one business standard, which this, both the security rule and the privacy rule call for business associate contracts and other arrangements to be in place, okay? And you have to get satisfactory assurances. This is another weasel word. What the satisfactory assurances mean? Well, I can tell you what it doesn't mean. If all you did was sign a contract with the BA and you haven't asked them about how they're complying with the security rule, the privacy rule, the breach notification rule, because now business associates are required to comply with that directly under the High Tech Act, right? If all you did was have them sign a contract and you didn't do anything else, well, you probably didn't get satisfactory assurances. Why is that a problem? Because if your BA screws up and has a major breach, some clever lawyer is going to file class action against you and say, on negligence and said, because you didn't get satisfactory assurances, you didn't meet the HIPAA standard, and therefore you're liable for a breach that was caused by one of your business associates, whereas if you got satisfactory assurances, you could make a good faith argument that you did what you could, okay? But if all you got was a signed contract, that's not going to get it done. All right. Now you got to have a signed contract, but that's not enough. Necessary, but not sufficient. <clears throat> okay. So the the administrative uh, safeguards are process centric. There's no such thing as a HIPAA compliant product. First of all, for anything, products can't be HIPAA compliant. Only covered entities and business associates. But there are no COTS commercial off the shelf uh, off the shelf software that's going to help you with the administrative guidelines. Okay. That's an organizational problem. That's a problem you got to solve for your organization. Now, this is the first standard. Now we're going to go through the standards one by one. Security management process. This is the monster. Risk analysis, otherwise known as a risk assessment. That's required. That, these are implementation specifications now. This is the standard. We saw that they were eight technical and one business. This is standard one. Implementation specification one. Two, implementation specification two, risk management. That's required. Sanction policy, that's required. Information system activity and review, that's required. So for the most important standard, the most complex standard, the most time-consuming standard, all four implementation specifications are required for that standard. So and what is that standard? Implement policies and procedures to prevent, detect, contain, correct security violations. This is, the, this is the standard that's going to require most of your attention. If, you, if you're looking at the top ten list of things to do, you saw that one of them was do a risk assessment. Well, a risk assessment is the first implementation specification of this standard. Okay. Security management process, risk analysis, risk management, and here are the steps that you got to take. Sanction policy, information uh, system review, I am going to just let you read these because I want to get into the most complex thing probably in, in the entirety of the security rule is performing your risk assessment. Now what I got to tell you up front is there's no requirement that you do and there's no such thing as a perfect risk assessment. Do a risk assessment even if it's bad. Document it. There are lots of things in the risk assessment that are not technical at all, like creating an inventory of all your objects that access or maintain or somehow touch PHI. That's just an organizational problem. Until you do that, you can't do the other steps, okay? And then keep getting better at it every time. That way, at least at a minimum, you can make a good faith argument that you did not stick your head in the sand, you're not in willful neglect. Yes, you didn't have a perfect risk assessment, but there are no such thing as perfect risk assessments, okay? And then you can make the argument, we think we did a we're getting better for an organization of our size, complexity, blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> okay, so the process is for risk assessment, gather, and this was based on the NIST standard, <clears throat> and this is mapped to our security rule checklist. So this is where we're getting this information. Gather, gather data regarding existing operations, assets, and individuals that touch EPHI, essentially. Okay, you have to identify and document potential threats and vulnerabilities. You have to assess your current security rules so that you understand your assets environment. You're going to have some security controls in place. What are they? Okay, you got to do a baseline assessment so that you know what you have to add to. You have to know what you're missing. 
You don't do an inventory of your as-is. How do you know what's missing? Okay. Then you're going to have to determine the likelihood of a threat, determine the potential impact of a threat, and determine the level of risk associated with threat vulnerability pairs. We're going to talk about threat vulnerability pairs a lot more in a few slides here. And then finally, identify new modified security controls and finalize the documentation. A risk assessment is not about implementing additional security controls. Okay, It's not an implementation process. It's an assessment analysis. You're just documenting what your threats, vulnerabilities, what security controls are missing. It's a documentation exercise, not an implementation exercise. The implementation exercise comes in the next implementation specification, which is called risk management. Martin, any questions here? Yes, this goes back to reasonable and appropriate. Isn't it easy to prove unreasonable after an incident? Well, I mean, that's going to depend. There, there are no, I mean, security, security is a, is a, um, a tough topic, right? The governments don't, our government doesn't get it right, right? It's incredibly complex. If you, within the size of your organization, complexity, et cetera, did everything that you could, let's say, let's say did you get satisfactory assurances? Well, you asked your BA for their uh, last risk assessment. You asked to see their policies and procedures, et cetera. You, you did what you don't, you, there's no requirement that you monitor, and it's an impossibility anyway, that you monitor their operations 24-7. We would never get any business done if we had to do that. So that's not the requirement, right? So you, there are there are good faith arguments that will get you out of a negligence claim, right, if you met the standard. That's the question. Did you get, in that particular hypothetical, did you get a, um, you know, did you get satisfactory assurances? If a breach happened, well, lots of ways that a breach could happen, you, 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 you know, yes, more than likely you failed to do something, but, you know, let's say you had all your uh, data encrypted. Your data in motion encrypted, your data across the wire encrypted, and when you were disposing of EPHI, you were doing it according to NIST protocols, and somebody broke into the office or, you know, or decided to rob the office or whatever and saw PHI as part of doing that because people had PHI on the screens, well, I mean, what else can you do? You can't. What else could you have done? Well, you know, you got to be able to see the PHI. The people working uh, in the hospital and doctor's office have to be able to see the PHI. Was there an incident? Yeah, it was exposed, but is it a breach? Probably not. So, no, it's not It's not that simple, you know, um, that it's automatically. But, yes, for most people, because most organizations have not done a rigorous implementation of either the privacy rule, security rule, or breach notification rule, they haven't done it. They haven't invested in it they're going to be found to be in willful neglect probably in three or four different areas. I guarantee it that that's what's going to happen. So, yes, it's going to depend on the, the rigorousness of your implementation. That, that's all we have at this time. Okay, so the risk assessment process is focused on analysis. The doing is performed in the next step. We talked about that. You're going to have to get comfortable with the lingo here before you can tackle a risk assessment. And I'm not going to read all these definitions for you. You can read them on your own. But some key ones, we're going to talk about what's an asset. Well, an asset is a thing, tangible or intangible, that uh, accesses, stores, maintains, or transmits EPHI, networks, PCs, servers, phones, information systems, buildings, people, all those are assets. Okay? You can read these. We're going to get to... Um, the risk assessment steps. So individual for the purposes of uh, our checklist uh, and um, this presentation, individual is synonymous with a workforce member. Likelihood, okay? We're not talking about a mathematical calculation here. You understand that these are subjective likelihood values. So likelihood is defined as a weighted factor based on subjective analysis of the probability. We're not doing math here, right? Math is impossible to do. But that doesn't mean that you don't have to go through the process of subjectively uh, assigning a li likelihood. And we follow the list, the NIST standard, saying that the likelihood, 
uh, is going to be high, medium, or low. What are your operations? Well, your operations are your processes and workflows that interact with EPHI. You guys know which ones, you know, your onboarding um, process, your clinical process, you know, all these processes, your billing process, they all interact with EPHI. All right, what's the definition of risk? Risk is the net mission impact considering, one, the probability that a particular threat will exercise either accidentally or intentionally, doesn't matter, that a particular threat will exercise a specific vulnerability. So you got a vulnerability and risk is what is the probability that uh, the threat is actually going to find that vulnerability and use it. That's the definition of risk. Risk assessment is what we're talking about right now. Risk assessment, risk analysis, these are used uh, interchangeably. Security controls. It's the management, operational, and technical control, essentially the safeguards and countermeasures prescribed for an information system to protect the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of the system and its EPHI. You can also have controls that apply to uh, your workforce, etc. cetera. So they're, they're, uh, it's broader than just what you're going to apply to information systems. You can have both technical and non-technical controls, and a lot of the controls that we're talking about in administrative safeguards are non-technical controls. Security objects. When we talk about security objects, we're talking about three things. Operations, that means your workflows. Individuals, that means your, your workforce. And assets. Um, a threat. What's the definition of a threat? The potential for a person or thing to exercise accidentally trigger or intentionally exploit a vulnerability, right? And you have natural threats, human threats, and environmental threats. And that threat landscape is changing on a daily, hourly basis. Okay? And the threat landscape is the set of threats that live out there in the wild that could potentially exploit a vulnerability in your environment. Okay? What's a vulnerability? It's a flaw or weakness in your system procedure, design, implementation, or internal controls that could be exercised by a threat. You don't have to memorize these. What you need to do is become comfortable with the lingo because the lingo is the lingo. Um, most of this lingo comes from NIST. Okay, it's the lingo that's used when you're performing a risk assessment. So if you're not comfortable with the language of risk assessment, it's going to be hard to communicate with a an auditor, with your executives, with a court of law, with your peers about what you're doing vis-a-vis -vis risk assessments. So we're going to go through these steps at a high level, and then we're going to go through to, through these steps at a um, more level of detail. And remember that we're talking about risk assessments right now. So the first step is to gather data. And part of what you're gathering is the as-is, operational environment pertaining to what your workflows, your assets, your PCs, mobile devices, servers, and your individuals, right? You go gather the inventory that you need to create a risk assessment. You don't need you don't need technology to do this. And there is some technology that could help you here. Uh, that application that HHS put out sucks, even for this part. So I, I wouldn't recommend using that. A spreadsheet is probably better than that. But you know, you just need to go out and gather this information. And we got some templates and spreadsheets that show you how to go about doing this. Step step two: gather threats and vulnerabilities that pertain to your operational environment. Now, if you've never done one and you're staring at a blank sheet of paper and you're not a technical person, right, and you're not, you're not certified to do this kind of stuff, then, you know, you're going to be pulling your hair out. Fortunately, you know, a lot of threats and vulnerabilities are common across environments, so we document some for you so that you're not looking at that uh, blank sheet of paper. And this is an area that we're going to produce better spreadsheets and better tools to help you better walk through this process, because once you understand the process, you will quickly be able to ascertain what tools can help you uh, and begin to hug the monster in a way that doing a risk assessment doesn't have to be this, uh, cause all this angst and, uh, and anxiety that it does today. You, you're going to want to assess your current security controls, okay, uh, just because you want to know what you have in place. If you already have something in place and it's working for you, then you don't need to add a control. Then you want to determine the likelihood that a specific threat will exploit a particular vulnerability. Vulnerability. Well, you can't. You can't 
determine the likelihood until you, you've identified the threats and the vulnerabilities, right? So identifying the threat vulnerability pairs, that's a starting place, right? Ob that's obviously a, 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 something that's complex. That's obviously something you're going to get better at. There are databases out there that can help you, but you know what? If you're doing this thing on a, on a shoestring budget, you can still get there because we provide you ways to get there. And, you can, and like I said, there's no such thing as a perfect risk assessment. You know, there are ones that haven't been done and ones that are good, ones that are better, ones that are much better. And as you continue to do these over time, uh, you should be able to make a good faith argument that you've gotten better at doing risk assessment. What is not acceptable is to do nothing. Okay. Step five, calculate the impact of that exploitation. Okay. Step six, determine the level of risk. Document new modified security controls to do what? To help you mitigate risk to levels that are reasonable and appropriate. Okay. That's the weasel words again. What are you trying to do? You've got all these threat vulnerability pairs. You've determined uh, risk. Now you want to implement security controls to reduce the risk to levels that are reasonable and appropriate. Okay. Now, before we go into the detail, any questions? Not yet. Great. You guys are great students, man. You've got this stuff down pat. So gather data. Now we're going into our checklist item. This gives you the policy for doing it. It's already should be in your policy document, right? This is in our security rule checklist. That's what we're looking at right now. Process the data gathering step is essentially an inventorying process pertinent to security options. We are interested in capturing operations assets and individuals, and we point you to uh, the, the tracking mechanisms, okay? And we will give you examples of in our, in our templates and spreadsheets of what operations are, what assets are, and what individuals are, but essentially you're doing an inventory process, okay? And here we are with one of our uh, spreadsheets, and we, we're identifying um, assets here, PCs, mobile phones, laptops, and by their um, you know, unique identifier. Now, this is not meant to be a comprehensive everything you need to know. It's meant to be a go by, a place so you're not looking at a blank sheet of paper so that at least you know where you could get started, right? So we have hardware assets, we have software assets, databases, operating system, applications, etc. And which ones are we concerned about? Well, we're concerned about the ones that touch, access, maintain, transmit EPHI, okay? You have building assets, rooms, entrances, etc. Okay, you have a spreadsheet for workforce members, right? Basic information, when they were hired, when they terminated, when were they last trained, just basic information about your workforce members. And your workflows, document your workflows. Now, a spreadsheet is an okay place to start documenting workflows, but tools like Visio and other uh, visual communication tools are much better. You should draw diagrams of your workflows so that you know where there exist EPHI touch points, okay? That's pretty simple. I mean, it's relatively straightforward. You've got to go gather the inventory. If you, if you haven't gathered your inventory and you can't show me as an auditor an inventory of your assets, operations, and work, and uh, your workforce operations and assets, then that's willful neglect. I mean, you just haven't even gotten yet. You didn't get stuck. Step one of a risk assessment. Okay. Step two, right, is maintain. It is our policy to maintain known threats and vulnerabilities. That's what our policy is. Processes are these. Threats and vulnerabilities will be gathered using recommended vulnerability scanning tools and alerts from other authoritative sources. You can get some freeware now out there that will help you scan your. Uh, networks, okay, that will help you do some identification of inventory, even from the prior step, or you can do it without scanning if you got a really, really small shop, but that's what you're, that, that's what you're doing. You're scanning, you're looking for additional threats and vulnerabilities, and uh, obviously a, a lot of this now has become automated, and this is one place where some software can help you, and then you, you're going to identify new updated threats and vulnerabilities that you've located through this additional scan, review, update your threat vulnerability and risk database, 
and then you, you're going to wind up comparing, do you have all the security controls in place for these new threats? Right? I mean, essentially, that's what the process is. So you go through this process of gathering threats and vulnerabilities. And there's natural threats, you've got floods, earthquakes, human threats, environmental threats, etc. You want to identify who the adversary is. Is it an individual, a group, an organization, government, um, that conducts or has the intent to conduct detrimental activities that will have a negative impact on your EPHI? It could be your own workforce member. It should be. Your own workforce member should be included here, right? You have a disgruntled employee. That's where a, a, a significant amount of threats and vulnerabilities uh, come from. So, yes, it's a little obtuse initially, but, you know, once you get the hang of it and you say, okay, yeah, uh, you know, th these these are threats, like not having all your software patched at the correct level. That's a threat, it's a vulnerability, right? The, 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 the threat could be that hackers are looking for unpatched software so that they can find an entry point into your network. So here we give you some sample threats, theft, theft of a laptop computer, theft of a desktop computer, theft of smartphone, you know, uh, holes in your, uh, things that you haven't done in your, for your primary facility, like, you know, no uh, backup generators, et cetera, et cetera, right? We give you in this spreadsheet threats, vulnerabilities, and risks. So this is our TBR spreadsheet, and here we're identifying the threats. Okay, and use this as a starting point, and yes, you can find additional resources that will help you identify threats, and then you walk through the process of, okay, do we have any security controls in place, right, that would prevent this threat from being exploited, right, uh, or not, and those would be your vulnerabilities. Okay, so vulnerabilities here is desktops are not physically locked. Uh, not all of our devices have tracking and recovery services. If you got mobile devices, no security cameras in the waiting room. All, you know, these are some of this is just basic common sense stuff that you ought to be thinking about uh, as as a way to start thinking and using the lingo to conceptualize what a risk assessment process is. I, I, I can assure you that uh, as painful as it looks and as painful as it is. It's like any other complex thing that you do. The more you do it, the more you touch it, the more you work with it, uh, the more you internalize it, the less painful it becomes. So assess your current security controls. I'm not going to spend much time here. Figure out what you got in place. Okay? That was the as is, the management operational and technical controls that you have in place to protect the confidentiality, integrity, and available, but you're going to have some security controls that you already have in place. Okay, some of them are technical, some of them are not technical, you just need to capture them in this inventory. You need to know what security controls you have in place so that you know what, what additional ones you need when you discover new threats and vulnerabilities. Okay, non-technical controls, this is what the administrative safeguards is all about, policies, procedures, standards, if you don't have these, these are the controls that are lacking. Okay, these are controls based on the subscription plan that we've provided that you should be able to implement readily because we've given them to you. Here they are. All right, you can go about go you go through them. Yes, they're complex, but you go through and work through uh, the checklist, and, and you should be in pretty good shape with respect to non-technical security controls. Okay, determining the likelihood of a threat. So you identify threat vulnerability pairs, and now the task is how likely is this particular threat? And the question you're asking here is, will the threat materialize? Will the, will the threat exploit one or more vulnerabilities? Okay, that's the question. That's what you're trying to answer, and you're going to you're going to uh, assign a probability of high, medium, or low to the likelihood that a specific threat will exploit a particular vulnerability. So you're working with threat vulnerability pairs. Okay. And if you have desktops that are not physically locked, the threat that somebody could walk in and steal that desktop and just walk out with it is high. 
That's what I would assign to it. So we've given you some examples here of what, you know, high, medium, or low. It's subjective, but still, you're assigning probability based on your current, current state of things. Okay, then determining the impact of the threat is the next step. The impact is the impact to the organization. It's really the business impact, the impact that an exploitation will have on your operational environment. In other words, just how bad is this threat exploitation going to ruin your day? What's going to be the magnitude of harm if this threat actually exploits the vulnerability? Again, this is subjective, but this is what you're trying to capture. Okay. So, you know, if you have a desktop, if you have PCs loaded with EPHI, which you shouldn't, right? PHI should EPHI should all be on centrally on central servers, controlled with server rooms, etc. But if you have laptops, PCs, phones loaded up with uh, EPHI, the threat level is high, and the impact to the organization. Well, that's going to be pretty high too because it's going to be a data breach and, and partially maybe loss of operational data. The impact level is high okay, uh, for uh, the impact of the threat. Should this threat exploit this vulnerability, what is, what is it going to do to our business, high, medium, or low? Okay, And this is really the diagram that you're working with. If conceptually you can master this diagram, you have operations, assets, and individuals. That's what security controls are applied against. Okay, You have to identify threat vulnerability pairs. Remember that a particular threat can exploit between 1 to n vulnerabilities. Okay, But you're calculating probability, likelihood of a threat exploiting a vulnerability, the impact to that threat, and the risk. You're calculating at you're making that calculation at a threat vulnerability pair combination. Okay? So determining risk. A specific risk level is calculated in quotes because it's not mathematical. Again, it's subjective as a function. Again, using mathematical terms, but it's not math. The function of the probability of a threat exploiting a specific vulnerability and the impact that exploitation is likely to have on your operations. Okay, so in the in the in the example where you had a um, an unprotected PC, phone, mobile device, okay, the impact if that was stolen because it had a lot of PH EPHI, and now on a mobile phone, you could probably have hundreds of thousands, and and, and on a laptop, probably millions. Of, of records, um, you probably have that now on a thumb drive, right? The impact level we determined in that example was high, okay? And the risk level, the threat, le the threat of that vulnerability being expo uh, exploited was high. The impact if that event should happen was high. And if you take a high high, the risk that you get out of that is probably going to be high, okay? But you could have a medium threat, a high impact, and a, that would lead a, to a medium risk. You, you, these are all subjective. You're just going to have to make business decisions and business calculations as to what the level of risk is. Okay, it's not math, but it is uh, rigorous analysis. And remember, in a risk assessment, you're not doing any implementation. Risk assessment is all about analysis. So this is what you end up with. Okay. Any questions? Sure. Uh, not at this time. Uh, but the one thing I would like to point out is the the high probability goes way down with encryption. That's well. That's a great point. I mean, you know, encrypt, encrypt, encrypt. Because if you encrypt according to the NIST standards and the recommendations by the HHS secretary. You can't have a breach by definition, so that is one way to, to mitigate. Uh, I, obviously, it doesn't eliminate everything because employees can still do damage, but it probably is the single biggest thing you can do to eliminate your risk, right? And that would be something you should convey to your executive team, your colleagues, uh, etc. So, and then at the end of the risk assessment, step seven, you document the security controls that are missing for the newly identified risk. 
okay? And then that becomes your new baseline for the next time you do a risk assessment. Okay, so that's it. Risk assessments, you end up documenting the new security control that you need to have in place. Okay, and you should have, you know, a security control spreadsheet at a minimum or a database, right, so that you know what you have in place and you know what you've added to so you can easily answer questions like, well, for this particular requirement, what do you have in place? All right, now there's multiple ways to skin a cat and again, this wasn't intended, these spreadsheets, these examples were intended to make visual uh, and concrete these concepts that we were that we were dealing with in a risk assessment, right? And this is a, a place where we're going to spend more time uh, to uh, take it to the next level to improve the value in your subscription plan around being able to do risk assessment. So here are the steps again, okay? And now what have we covered? We've covered standard one, implementation one, okay? And risk management, risk management really could swallow the entire security rule because that's the first thing you do in risk management is you perform a risk assessment. Why HHS decided to separate out the first implementation specification as a risk assessment when a second one also contains a risk assessment is, you know, God only knows. But the second one contains a risk assessment because this is your entire risk management methodology. This is everything in, in implementation specification two. Right? So I like to say that the second implementation specification under standard one swallows the security rule. Step one, assess. Well, this is the risk assessment that we just walked through. Okay, step two, simplify. Right? You're not going to be able to implement every security control that you identify. The threat landscape is too large. Right? You only have so much budget this year. You only have so much time. So you're going to have to simplify. You're going to have to make business decisions based on the newly identified risk as to what gets implemented this time. This is why it's an iterative, evergreen process. Okay? You simplify, and then you implement those security controls that you've identified, the most recent ones, right? That will take that will take the risk level down to levels that are reasonable and appropriate. And remember, reasonable and appropriate in all these weasel words, although they are weasel, weasel, weasel words, they all contain uh, or are encompassed by the flexibility principle of the security rule that says you can take into account you know, the size of your organization, the complexity of your operations, the amount of resources that you have, etc. That's why perfection is not the goal here. Um, a good faith effort a continuous this good faith effort is. So you review the baseline as is, what you have in place, and you become you come up with a delta list. For this iteration, what additional security controls are we going to put in place? Maybe during the first risk assessment you did, you didn't patch everything that you should have patched. And you just made the decision that you just didn't have the time or money to patch everything. Now you're going to identify other things to patch, etc. That's as simple as it can be. In other words, you already have something some of the necessary security controls controls in place. That's your as is. What new ones do you need based on the new risk that you've identified? That's how you simplify. Right? Document the rationale. Why did you choose these particular new risks to attack? Right? And step three then, remember we're going through your whole risk management program, is protect. Is actually implement those security controls that you've identified. Right? If there if it means patching additional uh, parts of your infrastructure, you do that. If, it's, if it means implementing some non-technical controls that you didn't have in the past, then you do that. If it means whatever, improving your security incident processing system, then you do that, right? Protect. This is where you actually do the implementation part of it, okay? And in this step, you're identifying and implementing, documenting the implementation of Security objects, security specific controls. So you could be implementing controls against networks, databases, applications, devices, workflows. Okay? All these are security objects, including ones that cut across the organization, disaster recovery, incident response. You know, they're not particular to a particular network, training awareness. They're really horizontal across the organization. 
Okay, step four is to monitor. You can't implement, it's not set and forget. So what have you put in place? What kind of continuous monitoring methodology do you have in place? And this usually means uh, managing alerts, having people look at information system logs on a daily basis, doing those kinds of things that allow you to monitor your environment. Because obviously, if you're not monitoring your environment, how are you ever going to know that, was, that there was a breach or an attempted breach? Right? So you're going to have to implement some sort of continuous monitoring methodology. And again, this is an area where there is some software out there that can help you, depending on your budget. And you have to identify that the workforce members that have been given this uh, this responsibility are adequately trained to monitor, right? What are they supposed to do, right? Who are they, who are they if they see a, a particular kind of alert, who are they supposed to report it to? These are organizational things that are, you know, you just need to think through, and you can implement something that's basic, right? Our in, we, give, we give you an incident tracking database, we give you an incident document. That's enough to get you started. That's enough to say, probably to say you have something functional in place. Okay, you, because of this 24-7, 365 environment that we live in, you're going to have to have a way of dealing with alerts that can happen in real time, right? And who's watching that? Well, somebody's got to be watching it, you know, at least on a, a, on a daily basis, some of these indicators. If you've got somebody that, uh, attempted to, to breach your network, you know, it's not going to do you much good a week later, if, you know, they've been in all week stealing your stuff. Bottom line is you're not going to be able to manage what you don't measure. That's what monitoring is. you got to measure the effectiveness of the security controls that you put in place. And then you got to have the ability to report out because if you don't report out, then you're not going to have, you're not going to know how well you're doing, right? It's a measurement step. Right. So reporting is you want to establish a governance structure where at least one member of the executive team is represented, and this will usually take the form of a governance committee that includes privacy and security and other stakeholders that you know that you can demonstrate that you have a governance here because HIPAA is now part of your DNA, because the organization considers it to be important, you have a governance structure uh, that deals with this, not some admin that's been given this you know, uh, totally insufficient budget and no one else in the organization knows anything about HIPAA. Right, like it used to be in the good old days. That's just not going to get the job done. So we recommend that you produce some reports, review quarterly around incidents, responses, controls, etc. And on a periodic basis, and at a minimum, and I mean a real, real, real minimum, once per annum, have a third-party outside expert review your risk mitigation program or do it yourself. Okay, but you got to review, and at the same time, you got to do a risk assessment at least once per annum. And repeat, this is an evergreen process. Okay? I'm going to pause there because the rest of the stuff, while it's not trivial, we only have five minutes left. We go a little bit over, but the rest of this will go kind of fast. Does anybody have any questions on the risk yeah. assessment piece? Uh, um, we have two questions, both regarding software, and they're, uh, they're basically the same. Is there any software out there that you recommend or are familiar with? Yeah, there. I mean, there, there, there's quite a few. The, the, um, they range from uh, software that are more, you know, repository kind of based, which, uh, you know, I, I think have, have dubious sort of value, to um, other software, for example. And this is not this is not an endorsement. This is just software that I'm aware of. Um, there's a company called Fair Warning out of, I, I believe, Sarasota, Florida, um, that will help you monitor your network and produce alerts. Um, there are software from the vendors, you know, of infrastructure like Cisco and HP. All of them have like console management software to detect all kinds of things. So it's going to be a combination of uh, infrastructure software coming from vendors uh, that will help you with, with this process uh, and then specialty software like Fair Warning uh, that has a better understanding of HIPAA specifically as a subject matter domain 
to other kinds of specialty software that uh, may help you analyze your network in terms of threat land the existing threat landscape. They actually have threat landscape databases that are maintained by software vendors. They do a scan of your software and then they I mean of your environment and then they compare that against their real time threat landscape, produce a report, produce you know remediation. Uh, I mean that that's there are solutions out there we could probably do and probably should do a um, a webinar for uh, our subscribers where we can do a little deeper dive into some of the solutions uh, that can help you along those lines. Uh, there are no more questions, but the, the thought occurred to me while you were saying that if we have business associates out there that are on today, that those some of those uh, software programs they can use to monitor their, their CEs as an add-on service, I would think. Um, what, what do you mean, monitoring their CE? Well, to to see if they can get into the network, to see if they can penetrate the... Uh, the oh, you mean the, there's some business associates out there that already do this sort of thing? Yeah, yeah. And yeah, right. Yeah, there's probably quite a few of them that are that are that are business associates. I mean, any 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 vendor that that um, almost all your software vendors that that touch are going to touch your EPHI in some sort of way. Uh, you know, even, even if it's just technical support, they become business associates, like your EHR vendor technical support, right? Uh, even if your EHI is hosted locally on a server, they become uh, business associates as well. So we are still under implementation specification one of the uh, administrative safeguard sanction policy, which is really self-explanatory. Somebody violates a security rule, you got to sanction them. Okay, and just got to document it, put it in their folder, etc. Information system activity review, you got to look at logs of your information systems that have EPHI. Somebody's got to be responsible for looking at logs. They should be looking at logs, you know, every day probably, but once a week minimally. I mean, you know, otherwise, you're never going to know something was logged. How would you know, right? Or if you get too many alerts, you get alert fatigue, you start ignoring them. Then you're gonna, you're not going to know. So information system activity review, it's all about it's all about monitoring, reviewing logs, and seeing what they've captured. Okay, additional technical standards. So we've gotten through the first standard. All that time, first standard, right? Assign security responsibility. Well, that's a no-brainer. Select a security officer, right? That's pretty straightforward to do. Name him, put that job title in his or her uh, personnel folder. Give them a budget, who they report to, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, we give you more detail in our checklist items, but essentially, you know, that's what you're doing. Workforce security, you know, define roles and responsibilities for job functions, and then only allow access to your systems, your network, your computing infrastructure that has EPHI based on their roles and, resp and, and responsibilities. This is pretty much how most application software vendors handle uh, security, as they do it by role and responsibility, right? So that, like. IT 101, uh, authorization or super and supervision, who in the organization is making the decision as to what workforce member is given what access, okay? If you probably give everybody all access, that's what will neglect, right? Essentially, you didn't do this part of the security rule. Just this part of the security rule says, essentially, you need to give access on a need-to-know basis. You just give everybody everything, you're in willful neglect. Workforce clearing procedure, exactly what it means, background checks. Right? You don't want to hire a felon that's been convicted for stealing uh, medical data uh, to work at your organization, right? I mean, that's just not going to be a smart thing to do, and doing clearance now is relatively straightforward on the Internet. Just do it before you hire. When you terminate, make sure that you dot the I's, cross the T's, get back all badges, change passwords, delete accounts, do everything you need to do to terminate an individual, an individual workforce member so they don't have access to the stuff that they used to have access to, okay? This healthware, healthcare uh, clearinghouse functions is really a specialty thing that I'm just uh, going to skip because it doesn't apply to most of you. Um, and if you do have clearinghouse functions, and you're a covered entity 
and you have like a mixed organization because you're doing clearinghouse functions for other covered entities, you need to make sure that there's a Chinese wall between your work as a CE versus your work as a clearinghouse. Uh, nowadays, most clearinghouses, I believe, are independent. Access control means exactly that. It is, you're using some sort of access control mechanism in an application to see who has access to what. Okay, Most of that is built into networks. It's all built into your application systems. You just got to use it appropriately. You have to def use it on a need-to-know basis to make sure that the applications are doing the right thing based on roles and responsibilities. Okay, I'm going to uh, skip these sort of because they're kind of obvious. Security awareness and training. How can you expect somebody to comply with the security rule when they haven't been trained? All right? That's willful neglect. That's why we have a security rule training module that you should run everybody through, right? And have everybody take the test. They got to get 70% or better to uh, um, to pass. And if they don't pass, they got to take it again. Okay? You got to have uh, the, the ability to send out security reminders. Every once in a while, if there's a new virus, some new worm, something that you know has attacked organizations like yours, you need to be able to send out those reminders and say, oh, by the way, be careful of this new phishing scheme, etc." Okay, so protection from malicious software, right? This is IT 101. So, we are quickly going through these administrative management, I mean, administrative safeguards because they're just common sense at this point, right? Security incident procedures we talk quite a bit about. Um, now, contingency plan, this is a place that, yes, it's common sense, but most people aren't doing it to the level that you need to be doing it. There are a lot of uh, high quality, lower cost solutions out there with backups to the cloud that can really help you with hosting data on your cloud so you're not subject to being uh, destroyed by Katrina. There's a lot of things in this contingency space that you need to be looking at today because this world has really become more accessible to smaller players. Okay, you got to have data backup plan, recovery plans. These are, again, IT 101 sorts of things. If you don't have it, you're going to be dinged. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know maybe not a willful neglect thing, but you're still going to be thing for not having sort of these basic requirements that you got to have in place. Not only do you have to have a disaster recovery plan, you got to be able to test it, either desktop test it or actually test it, right, depending on how much resources you have. Otherwise, it's really uh, no good, okay? Uh, you have to have an inventory of your critical applications so that you know should Katrina hit, what do you have to bring online first, second, third to get most of your operations back? All, right? All this kind of stuff is really disaster recovery planning. All right? And then you got to evaluate your security program from time to time. And really, you know, you should be doing it yearly. Right? Maybe at the same time you do the yearly risk assessment, you should be evaluating the entirety of your program. Okay. Again, we've talked about the business standard. This is a uh, business associate contract. You've got to have a written contract, etc. That covers this first segment. Uh, and Martin, I'll kick it to you. We're about five minutes, six minutes over. If there's any questions, or well, we don't have any questions this time, but I would encourage everybody if they go back. Oops, thanks guys, we got one of those. Good job. Okay, I'll pass those along. Everybody likes those. Um, if after you ruminate on this a little bit, you have questions, uh, we can start off or work with in the in the second segment with those questions from the first because it's a lot. We covered an awful lot today. Correct. Right. If this is something that you got to kind of you know let it marinate. Uh, we can deal with these questions that you come up with next Wednesday at the start. Uh, this is by far the most complex material that we're going to cover. You know, all this risk assessment stuff and how you go about doing it, et cetera, et cetera. So if you if you do come up with questions, we can start with Q&A uh, before we move on to a different topic uh, next week. Um, 
And if there's no questions now, thanks for listening. It's been my pleasure being with you again today.